<coughs> so somebody <coughs> asked me, it's not, not unusual question, how, how does one let go? <laughs> and you think... <laughs> and uh, I don't think you really do. Um, you know, you can push things away temporarily. But there is there is letting go or, or release, which is not done through volition. It's not I let go; it just it drops off, it falls, it things. There's a release, there's a shift. It's very much associated with a kind of movement out of the realm of self. So I can't let go, but the path can take this mind to the place where letting go happens or where holding doesn't happen, clinging doesn't doesn't take place. Mm. I think it's quite important to, to get that. There's a difference between renunciation, which is something you can do, and it's very helpful because it, you do get the understanding that, yeah, you can put that aside and, is a bit uncomfortable at first and feels strange, but oh, yeah, I'm okay. Uh, it gives you some sense of confidence in that uh, movement out of the familiar, out of the known, out of the more habitual. Certainly, as we come into that sense of, you know, putting aside its entertainments and. Uh, so forth, yeah. even temporarily. Yes, oh yeah, you can do this. And a bit more space opens up, maybe. Mm. Yeah. And then you tend to, the mind will then tend to orient around, you know, the calm or body, breathing. Or just thoughts, you know. So then it tends to cling to that. Mm. Yeah. Or feed upon it. Mm. But the sense of being able to shift is is important because that's where you get the arising of faith. You know, the something one can effect you effect that is a complete paradigm shift from accumulation and possession and more and faster and so forth. Oh, that's really interesting, isn't it? And it's not bad. It feels strange. Sometimes it's quite uncomfortable at the moment. But then oh, the, we're able to regroup around an experience where there's less going on and uh, find some benefit in that for calm and clarity and insight. Also just sense of composure, healing the mind, healing the system. But clinging or feeding on is pretty much our nature or the nature of incarnation. <laughs> You know, just what's called the the five aggregates, upadana kanda. They're called upadana kanda, or aggregates associated with clinging. So body, you know, and feeling, and mental formations, fundamentally volition, wish, desire, forming, and uh, consciousness perception, impressions. So that they bundle things together. They, when we have an impression or a perception, you take a few sense impressions and a thought and a memory and you stick it together into, oh, that's, she's like that. You know, I recognize her because 
a voice reminds me of this and that, and that becomes a whole person. Mm-hmm. You know, in our mind, we carry around these perception aggregate which can form a person out of a few seconds of speech sight that's her eyes you know boom there it is whole person that's her laugh that's his way of expressing himself you suddenly get the whole thing with often a, a kind of a feeling with it agreeable feeling or disagreeable feeling that's that's um, sanya kanda. It sticks things together. That's kind of handy, isn't it? So you don't have to relearn every day what things are. You can just get a couple of suggestions, and oh, that's a that's what tea's like, or <laughs> you know, it it creates something for you. <laughs> and uh, body. You know, you don't have to learn how to put your socks on each day. Start again. (laughs) You know, something knows what particular sensations and uh, qualities of feeling are the right way, you know, to put your socks on or the right kind of temperature to to bathe in. You don't burn. Mm -hmm. These... Things are apprehended and, and stuck together. And that's the upadana kanda. Mm. Body. Actually, then when you contemplate body in terms of uh, meditation, is what is it, really? You know, it's a very obvious thing. What is it? Well, the, the visual body is very different from the tactile body, isn't it? What we see, isn't it? What we feel through our sense of touch. The sense of the internal body, the energies, the warmth, the sense of vitality or lack of it is quite different from the visual perception of it. You know, you can see people were looking quite well and you realize that someone's got cancer, liver cancer or something like that. You know, they don't mm. yeah. A sense of internal body, things that like balance, vitality, um, sense of having a presence. Mm-hmm. It's quite different from the visual body or even the tactile. So, what is a body? Mm-hmm. And the way that one sees one's own body is probably very different. Must be from the way somebody else sees it. Or you're a doctor, how you see a body. What is it? Mm. And yet we'd all come to the agreement that we all have them. And the, 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 the visual one is definitely something we can photograph or draw or something like that. We tend to abide in that impression. But it's just in it, just one impression, isn't it? When you meditate, what do you have? You have qualities of sensation, which is rupa, form, sensation, heat, or vitality, or pressure, that's uh, air, or firmness, earth, or cohesion, shape, um, interconnectedness, water, these elements. Are you walking up and down? What are you experiencing actually? A body? Or is it more contact impressions? Rupa. And uh, feeling. Mm. Isn't that more the way it actually is? Is that in that way? Mm. But that doesn't work if you're going to a tailor or, a, you know, to try and what kind of clothes you need or a shoe shop. You can't really use that language you have to say, I'm a size this or a size that, which is true. <laughs> you 
any of it true? <laughs> in a very contingent and dependent and uh, relative kind of reality. Mm. But the working model is that these five aggregates do a reasonable job in terms of um, social life, mm. but don't do very well in terms of uh, liberation. <laughs> tend to get a lot of suffering heaped up around being a visual body or even a tactile body. Mm. Uh, comparisons and effort and so forth, trying to make it something that really holds together and is, you know, satisfactory. So in our life we have to be with these aggregates and they're really the most convenient way of knowing this experience. They're really not things in themselves, they're just ways of knowing. So we can call a body can be just a form, form aggregate. It's just the way of knowing it. Keeps it quite simple. And then you contemplate within that for the purpose of liberation. You know, how solid is it? Whose is it? How satisfactory could it be? These three signs, three questions. And if you find it can't be solid, it can't be owned, and it can't be uh, something that supports and satisfies us, what's the relationship to that? You keep bringing the mind to that, bringing your awareness to that. You can't dismiss them, these aggregates, because that's kind of where we come together can't dismiss them and you can't hold on to them keep bringing your mind to that place <laughs> bring your awareness to that place that's where letting go happens and openness and out of that as we can't get away and we can't hold on we can't make it work we can't get off the track either. Here it is for a lifetime. So what's the response? What's the relationship? Mm -hmm. That's kind of like just the, all we can say is there's, there's the question, there's the, there's the koan. Is the place the unanswerable question? And something has to mature, open up, wisen up. It's helpful, the Buddha pointed to the four particular volitions, or sankharas, to do with clinging. And this is the one that one can definitely isolate and uh, relax. So in the sankhara aggregate is where you can uh, penetrate and relax. The, the volition, the push, the compulsion, the the rush, the resistance, the holding on, mm. as in energy. The four four bases that are sense sensuality or sense contact, and rushes in to absorb that sense contact. Mm. 
you can pause. You can, wait a minute, what's happening? How, where will this last? How, where will this land? We think it's going to land in me. Hmm? <laughs> yeah. But the me that it lands in is not the same me as the one who wants it. <laughs> yeah. So I see my food and the eye, oh, it looks really nice. Oh, fancy that, it's good, yeah. That's going to get that, you know, that kind of thing. But the one who gets it is different. It's, oh well, another one would be nice. You know, it changed, doesn't it? It shifts. That was, you know, the one who wants it is different from the one who gets it. When I feel in a state of wanting and craving, it's quite a different experience than having. Having, you know, well, it's got, where did the sight go when you're eating your food? Where did the sight go? Where did the colors go? Where did the fragrances go? Where did the tastes go? You know, did you get them? Did you have them? You must have, because you've eaten the thing. Where did it go? <laughs> now, the other, there's another feeling there now. Instead, it's kind of feeling slightly full. <laughs> So, who got who got it? Who got anything? <laughs> Just a kind of blur, isn't there? Uh, well, you know, because in that momentum, you know, we, the momentum takes over of, of absorbing, and we're in that. We're in that kind of activated state, and then the activity stops, and we're in the oh, right. Well, a cup of coffee would be nice, wouldn't it? Wash that down. Go for a walk chat, you know, we're into the next momentum, next rolling on so we're just saying pause it's not there's something wrong, really far from the unconsciousness of that yeah. so obviously renunciation is helpful just to you know, put throw a spanner throw a, in, the, in the works of that drive, just to check it, I mean it's not really the ultimate practice or ultimate solution. You don't really, it's really to understand how the process, clinging, craving, clinging, becoming, being, how that operates. And pausing, widening, opening to... Who get, they ask these questions, who gets it? Nobody gets it. Who's satisfied by it? What's the satisfaction? Mm. There's some, you know, the hunger passes or the, but then there's that slightly, you know, fancying something else. Mm. The whole process changing, shifting, moving along, impermanent. So in a sense, we contemplate that. Yet here we are in a world that keeps presenting sense contact. So yeah, we say, you know, we'll clean the hall because it's better that way. <laughs> on, on a level of convention. And yet you know it's never clean. And you can always do something more to make it a bit nicer and it will always dirty up again, crack, plaster will crack, the wood will splinter, the dust will come in. And, but, you know, for sake of orienting around convention, you know, we'll just have a nice, clean place. Wash the body, tidy your clothes. You know, keep it that way. Because there's a sense of an orderly relationship of caring. That is important. Now, these are ways in which awareness is brought into our life rather than views, rather than opinions, rather than dogmas or attitudes, just ongoing caring attention. And to me, this to me is really one of the qualities that seems to be enhanced in this letting go experience as it happens. Not another position 
but a kind of okay well what's what's helpful what's skillful what you know caring relationship and I said well you know second base of clinging is assumption or ditti perspectives views and these in this way these are really quite quite unconscious assumptions I like to think of them as assumptions because the assumptions the ditti refer to uh, being, becoming and non-becoming which are not kind of thoughts that are constantly moving through the mind they're underlying assumptions that there for example there will be a next that's becoming isn't it that's what it means this and then, then I will continue to the next thing there'll be another day another hour um, the next and there's going to be a progressive there's a continuity that goes on the continuity of time mm-hmm. so there's goes planning worrying building up yeah. planning worrying building up anticipating dreading getting complicated around just how much you know we can spin out into the world of time and continuity. Particularly now you have uh, so much more uh, systems that help one to do that. You know, organizing your next month, your next year. You can get so like cyber pieces of software that will do it for you. So your life can be incredibly complicated <laughs> with to-do lists and birthdays and anniversaries and memoranda and you know what's on television, latest news hit. And you've got all this stuff can come in in a very solid world of becoming. Yeah. That which we brought into existence gives us Oh, that's what's happening, and the weather report in Tokyo, and the price of oysters in Marseille, or whatever. (laughs) You can have it all. (laughs) You can get a very, very thorough and dense web of world, just flash in on your little gadget. And then you can have a a Facebook, circles, um, where you can have a whole kind of web of people out there. Who will then send you, when you're sitting there, your, their photographs of their holidays in Florida or Iceland or somewhere? You can have that too. There they all are. It's all my friends, 300 of them, <laughs> constantly sending me their recipes, photograph of their cat, uh, news about the new baby, uh, football scores in Venezuela. <laughs> <laughs> and they have this kind of web of it. You go, Gee, it sounds awful. To me. <laughs> and yet, uh, you know, there's something about that sense of, I guess, because these are very popular, uh, of solidity and continuity. And then planners, you know, organizing things for the best, uh, fastest traffic and you know, the price of railways and so forth. Wow, you know, just here we are, you know, sitting in your room, you switch your little thingy, and like within 10 seconds, you're just kind of totally <laughs> overwhelmed by it all. <laughs> and then you switch it off, here we are, breathing in, breathing out. <laughs> but then, of course, breathing in, breathing out, you get a whole world around that, can't we? Systems, techniques, structures, suttas, Mahayana, attitudes towards it, or Mahasi, or Taoist breathing in and out, yogic breathing in and out, um, you know, subtle energies, feelings, sensations, how to watch the breath, how to be with the breath, how much, what, da 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 da, another whole kind of very dense world. We have a web 
I would imagine on breathing. A website on breathing. We can all kind of chip in. And yet, you know, on one level, just happening, isn't it? Breathing in, breathing out. And so you get a sense of solidity and continuity in how far you will progress in it. And this, to me, certainly feels like um, stress, suffering there. And yet, you know, as you practice it, you, conventionally speaking, you get better at it. You know, or maybe you don't. Maybe, <laughs> maybe after 15 years, you're still not getting any better at it. <laughs> Whatever. You're not becoming. But still the assumption is that one should become, that one has become hmm, better, worse, or hasn't really become very good at it after all these years. So any of those positions actually is still seeing things with the eyes of becoming. You know, I have not become, that's still imagining you should become. I have become this or that or the other. And then there's the opposite view or assumption is of non-becoming. So it's of trying to absent oneself from experience. When becoming doesn't work, we try to, you know, the opposite extreme pulling out, there's no such thing as present moment, there's no such thing as the future, there's no such thing as a body, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Here we are. We are here, we are breathing in and out, there are humans, there is communication, there is a need to set responsibility for consequences, there is, conventionally speaking, a future, a past, the world around us, you know, and yet there isn't. So, you see the tendency to, to have these strong assumptions. And how to relate to that. Pausing. Yeah, and then how, what can you actually manage to allow to bring into fruition? What can you help to bring into fruition? What can you become in a way? That is, you become more open, more willing, more reflective, wiser about what you can actually bring to fruition, what causes and conditions you can support, what causes and conditions you can let go of, what causes and conditions you know, are the most useful. So we start to look at that list and think, I don't really care, I don't really need to know the best kind of lasagna, I don't need to, it's just, just you know, how to just hold the mind open and steady, you know, with what happens, with what's coming up. Mm. That's quite a lot of letting go, actually, but it's a, because, well, you know, could you give me more detail on that? Hold the mind open with whatever arises? Not really. <laughs> Just to have that stopping suffering, that might be another way of looking at it. And continually using the three characteristics, changeability, non-conclusiveness, dukkha, and uh, non-gratification, dukkha, and uh, non-solidity, not self, empty. And we just keep practicing when those signs are being refuted, when it does seem to be something solid that we are, or could be, or aren't, good or bad, what needs to be, what's the response to that? We find those stuck places, those intense places, those desperate places, those yeah, proud places, mm. those demanding places. You, know, you see, it's, there's a sankara there. There's an energy that's as a, a, a pumping that up. Yeah. 
So it's not, it's that energy that you can stop pumping up. You can't really stop the process of becoming in terms of the aggregates. That is, the body does become, you know, the mind does become happy or whatever. Um, different states of consciousness do arise, but there isn't the the pumping and the despair and the frenzy and the conceit going on with it. As things do are in the world of that which is in the world of becoming continues to be that way. Yeah. And you kind of relate to that, open to that. Surely it's best to have a good kind of becoming than a bad one. Yep, this is true. And when we do become wiser, more composed, more calm, more joyful, more warm-hearted, this is the best kind of becoming. There are skillful things that can arise there, and fundamentally it will give us a greater possibility to really see things clearly and apprehend the way to the that which is not the unbecoming the deathless, the unborn. So you just contemplate what one becomes or what you think, you know, the world is or yourself or, you know, what you want to make solid. How much is resting on that? How much is resting on that? Solid community, so forth. How much is what's how much is being invested in that? You know, it's not that we shouldn't practice in a way that will be the optimal for those cause for that skillful thing to arise, but you know how far can you go? How much is invested in that? So it's that particular pushing and pumping. Similarly with the sense sense contact, we have to see, hear, touch and so forth. What's the drive into it and what's the resistance to it? Mm. Similarly, contemplate the seeing, it becomes rather simpler. Just apprehending sankara, the volition, the making, the constructing, the investing in and the resisting and so forth. There's a particular energies there, aren't there? Yeah. Sometimes you can feel them in your body. Particularly when you come to the next base, which is a, a, a sila vata, which is to do with systems and customs. Mm-hmm. You know, procedures, rules, and uh, of course, monasteries are great places for rules. This is a rules sanctuary. All the rules that can't be kept anywhere else, we gather them here like they're kind of endangered species. <laughs> Keeping rules alive, you know. We've got rules you wouldn't believe. <laughs> I've got a rule about a, a, an itch covering cloth. One of my favorite rules, the kind of itch covering cloth I can have. I've never actually used that rule, but I've got it. <laughs> I've got a rule about visiting uh, stream enterers and who are part up and uh, being careful not to you know overextend their their uh, offers. And I've got a rule about um, not bathing more than once a fortnight if I'm within the Ganges Valley. Something like that. <laughs> unless, and there's always, there's always this kind of unless, which kind of unravels the whole thing, unless you really need to. <laughs> anyway, the point is, we've got rules. It's like, you know, like we've got rabbits, and uh, where everybody else they're getting shot down and blown apart, we, we collect them all. And you can't ever get rid of them. You know, once you've established one, and it's no, this is a tradition. So, yes, then we get proto, then you get kind of, Another set of rules called the 
core what, which is, means the training standards. Well, in Chithurst, we wear our robes at this, and we don't wear them at that, and we don't have cheese in the evening. Some places do have cheese and so forth. You, know, you get more and more than wearing your hats in-house, whether you have socks or so forth. And I think some monasteries, you know, somebody was saying that in Sri Lanka, they have rule, different monasteries have different kind of standards about umbrellas. So you go to one monastery and this is the right kind of umbrella and you go to the next monastery and look at you like, who are you, man? What's that kind of umbrella you're wearing? That's shameful. <laughs> <laughs> it's too bright or something. It's yellow and it should be black or something like that. Because, you know, how could you possibly have a yellow umbrella? <laughs> Just like worldlings who delight in the pleasures of the senses. <laughs> So you get all these kind of things, you think, gee, is this making me any better? <laughs> and yet, yeah, you know, rules are important, aren't they? It keeps us all kind of on the same page. Uh, you know, obviously the rules is about restraint and aware relationships and uh, living lightly, not grabbing a whole lot of stuff. Uh, things that facilitate uh, um, skillful communities, uh, things that maybe look appropriate for a religious life in the West rather than Asia. You know, the whole lots of rules about eating. One of them is they can't stuff your hand in your mouth when you eat. Well, actually, I can't even get my hand in my mouth. But just imagine, wonder when they created that. You know, who? who <laughs> obviously, somebody was doing it. <laughs> You know, four fingers in their mouth because <laughs> you didn't have a spoon, so you're going to get obviously if someone's a bit sort of hungry, I guess. They don't want to go <laughs> stuff oh, half a hand down their throat, so you've got a rule against that. <laughs> Probably just as well. Uh, <laughs> But in some places, they don't think you should use spoons because spoons is a bit sort of, you know, no foppish, you know, like spoon. Where are you? You know, you're in a restaurant or something. You know, someone who need a spoon. That's for kind of worldlings have spoons. You, know. you just use your hand. You know, you've got this mitt, use your hand. And I say, oh, you, want, you know, so. Careful you don't scrape your bowl. And so on. So, of course, the bowls in the days of the Buddha were rather more fragile, you know, than the things we have now. You could drive a car over my arm's bowl and it probably wouldn't damage it. But I've got to treat it like it's made out of bone porcelain, which is good because you get more mindfulness and so forth. <laughs> and you can't, once you've got them, you see, you can't really say, oh, well, we've, we've trashed the rules. <laughs> We dump that rule. Now you say, well, um, yeah, we kind of keep that one because we're a rule, rule accumulators. And then, but then it's really trying to recognize one's attitude towards this. You know, are you taking it like something you get all fired up about? <clears throat> or you get flippant about, like I've just been. <laughs> uh, you know, and you say, well, you know, I don't like getting fired up. But I don't think being laid back and flippancy either, you know. You know, so we're learning to, you know, okay, where's the sense of just care, attentiveness, thoroughness, seeing cause and effect in what we do, you know, like, in some ways, because we're constantly, in a way, modelling, aren't we, whether we like it or not. You do something, five of you do it, three other people will go, oh, okay, that's the way we do it. And they won't necessarily know that you're doing it carefully or mindfully. Or there's a reason for it. So, you know, you can't, you're really trying to get the sense of what helps us to get the volition, the intentions, the attitudes right. And generally we kind of swing, we sort of wobble really between too tight, too loose until you're finding something that feels about, yeah, this is caring, this is attentive, 
we're aware of consequences to actions, aware of you know how this affects other people. You know? So you sort of say, well, I, you know, I'm talking alone with a, a a woman, and I have to have somebody else, another man, with me. You know. You say, well, is it really necessary? I mean, the woman is seventy-five years old. <laughs> uh, but you say, well, I can't really always say, well, I don't fancy her. <laughs> I'm only going to have a man with a woman I fancy. <laughs> or the ones who fancy me. I don't know, you know. Or what other people might think. Or if you start to do that, then does it become a blanket statement? Say, so, okay, look, I just keep the rule for the sake of it because it's easier that way than trying to, you know, work in the potentials for sexual energies to move around, which move around anyway. You know, you can't have a rule that says you can't feel things. <laughs> you can only say you have a rule that says you don't act. Uh, so you still have to feel those energies anyway. But then you've got something that says, oh, you can contemplate that. Feeling attracted, uh, a sense of the energizing, the somewhat you know, contemplate. It's actually slightly unpleasant, you know. Pleasurable if there's that possibility of moving into action on it, maybe. But just as that activation, it's sort of like, oh, I don't like it. It's kind of jangling, driving. So, you, yeah, so the rule helps one to look into an energy. Activations, <coughs> compulsions, yeah. Or the idea we just if we just kept all the rules, everything would be right. That doesn't work either. You just get because people are keeping rules with hard heartedness or uh, dogmatism systems. And of course, it extends beyond training rules. It extends to any way we systematize experience. It's really a convention. So you know, not just monasteries. People have etiquette systems around eating and around greeting each other and who gets what you say to elders or youngers or children or parents and you know uh, all those are kind of unwritten codes mm-hmm. uh, just trying to recognize a user code and uh, you know a sense of wanting everybody to do the same thing or imagine it's going to make life steady and stable. Nope, it won't. You know, everybody's going to do the same thing. And it's not going to make things steady and stable, but it doesn't mean everything's going to go to ruin either. <laughs> to use it carefully, you know what you can do with it. You can bring around mindfulness, clarity, awareness, conscience, concern, attentiveness, and so forth. Using it to develop a right relationship rather than clinging. Of course, the fundamental form of clinging is clinging to the sense of self, which is really running right through everything else, isn't it? Who's this happening to? Who's doing this? Pausing. Where did that land? Where did that thought land? Where's it going now? The arising. So arising and passing is one of the ways in which you really look into that. The arising, the volition, I do, who does? Who's that? What's going along with that? Is it, you know, skillful or unskillful? Is it stressful or conducive to the ending of stress? So we look into volition in the arising of things, the arising of the mind, the ending, look into perception. Who did this happen to? Who's, what impression is left there? Busy, happy? Disappointed, mood feeling. Mm. 
Good? Is that good? Did you do good? Or not good? Or somewhat good? Or not so good? Mm. How was it? Where is it landing? How does it feel in your mind? How does it feel in your body? Letting it just trickle away, because it's what it does. We're not having to let go of it, just not to, just to, you know, allow it to follow through. Mm-hmm. Don't look back. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't look back on it. Don't play with it anymore. Just let it move through. Took you to some place where you feel regret. Okay. You know, sadness, okay. You know, happiness, it's okay. Feeling good about yourself, it's okay. <laughs> you know, you don't have to have neutral feeling all the time. You can feel great, terrible, or whatever. It's okay. Just let it move through. And then what's the, what's the, when you come into that, that, what wants to do the next thing? What comes out of that? Hmm? Can the next thing, if there is a next thing, (laughs) there generally is a next thing. (laughs) Something that really clearly arising, clearly held rather than just the, oh, I've got to do something more, or trying to compensate for the last thing we did. I made a mess of that, so I don't do this. No, it's actually what is the next thing. So we're particularly helping to create some space between the endings and the new beginning. This is where the karma of self. Calm, self is really a way of describing how karma is accumulated. A continuity of cause and effect. If the continuity is, is allowed to broke to break or to separate, the sense of self is not fed into. And we can really can be that fresh quality. And also the ability to just okay, begin again, let that one pass. Again, willing, fresh, rather than constantly building something up. So with these, clinging can then be um, weakened and seen through in its most, uh, in the place where it can be, which is to do with sankhara, volition, volitional qualities, the activities that, that bind and generate. Mm. We can work on that and you're really able to live in a world of feeling, body, perception, sense contact, sensuality, responsibilities, social engagements, the sense of, yeah, it's, it's there, isn't it? That's the human being. And you're not pumping it up, and you're not cutting it down. 